I hope you guys can see me and hear me. If you can, just wave at me so I know. Ah, that is beautiful. Well, listen, what an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Let me just make sure I my, put my little something on there. What an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. And uh, Reggie, where have you been, man? Like, seriously, it is to take Linson for you and I to connect. Uh, well done, Pastor Linson. Uh, I, uh, man, I remember Reggie coming out back when he was a youngster. Just the heart of worship has always been on him. And what an amazing, um, you know, privilege it is for us to collaborate after a few years. Pastor Linson, Pastor Sadish, I thank you for the invitation for tonight. Um, I really feel that uh, for this weekend, it, what you're going to get out of it is what you put into it. Uh, if you come here with, uh, with already overflowing and full and not needing to eat, then, um, then it's just going to be one of those meals that are so, sort of kind of okay. But if you come here hungry and, and, and with great expectation, I absolutely believe the Lord is going to speak to you. And, and this could be the beginning of a shift and a change in your life. Uh, like Pastor Linson said in the beginning, um, you know, there's just been testimonies from the last time that, I, that we did a leadership conference. There's genuinely an anointing. Here's the secret I found. And for the pastors, this might be helpful. Anything you want to see manifest in the kingdom of God, you, you teach along those lines. Because when the teaching is coming forth and the anointing that is surrounding that particular block of information comes together with the teaching. So if you want to see healing, teach on healing. And so you will find that those that do see it, if you want to see deliverance, teach on deliverance. If you want to teach salvation, see salvation rather, teach on salvation. So because we're teaching on leadership, I absolutely believe that the anointing to identify and to equip and prepare the next group of leaders is going to be with us this weekend. Um, it, it's, it's been an honor. And I, I, you know, I had great expectations for the Lord doing something in 2020, just like Pastor Linton says. And, um, and in 2020, the Lord did some pretty amazing things. Amongst other things, just taught me that there's not one way to do a thing. There are multiple ways by which you can, you can have impact. And so I want to begin just by really dealing tonight with the more spiritual aspect of, uh, of the leadership, anointing on the leadership call. Um, because again, that's what we want to sto stoke up. We want to sto stoke up the anointing um, that gets things done. And, and that's what I'm looking at for today. And uh, for friends and, and, and neighbors who I haven't seen in a while, uh, I'm glad we can, we can link up this way. Uh, Stephen and Stacy, you know, after that leadership conference, um, I think Stephen may have testified of what happened in, in his life, but I'm also just blessed by the connection that we had. He gave me an opportunity to, uh, to do a leadership uh, training for Microsoft employees. That was pretty cool. And some of those guys are still linked with me. They still check on me every now and again. So it was a powerful time. So listen, I'm here to let you know that this works. Amen. This works. And in fact, if you're a child of God, resident on the inside of you, according to our understanding of scripture, is the spirit that the Bible identifies as the spirit of wisdom. That means that the spirit that knows everything that there is to know about the world, not just about the world, but about the whole, the way the whole thing runs together. That spirit, that genius behind all of creation, the power behind creation. We know that creation was achieved by the, the word of God, but the power of, of, of that word was the spirit of God because the, the spirit hovered upon the surface of the waters, then God spoke, and then it happened. Well, the genius that stitched everything from subatomic material to atoms, to, um, to molecules, to you know, whichever way you look at it, the, the mind that put that entire fabric of creation together has chosen to live on the inside of you. That's why stupidity is not good for the church. We cannot be just dumb individuals that think we can bungle our way through stuff. No, the spirit of wisdom lives in us. And Pentecostals, you know, the more crazy we become, it does not necessarily mean the most spiritual. I grew up in the church like that. Amen. That when we're completely crazy and, and that was the spirit of God, brother, not necessarily. Today we want to look, hopefully, that the anointing of the Lord, the anointing of the spirit of the Lord, who is the genius behind creation, may, may just impart to us something powerful and special, particularly in regards to this amazing calling, the calling of leadership. I always like to begin the book of Genesis. Um, the book of beginnings. What am I expecting for each of you? I'm expecting some of you to step up into your call, 
but also to step up in your area of occupation on your job. I expect you to step up in your community and your neighborhood. I expect you to show initiative because there's no use in teaching leadership if we don't follow through. Because as we follow through, the Lord will begin to do some amazing things. It's time to take the mantle of your calling. So here is your initial calling and my initial calling. It's found in the book of Genesis chapter one. And I'll be reading from verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them have dominion. Now let them, now the term man is not males, it's mankind. Adam is the, is, is the, is the, is the term for the entire species. Listen, listen to what the Lord says. Let us make man, mankind in our image and according to our likeness. The image of what? The image of God. So God created man in his own image and in the, uh, in, in, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Then the first thing that the Lord does, so now notice this, the Lord says, I want to make you and I will give you as a gift my resemblance. Very, very crucial that you understand that. I will make you in my image and my likeness. The only species on the planet where there is evidence that the Lord had a conversation before creation. Everything else was let there be, let there be, let there be. You know, just coming out of his mouth like words shooting out and causing, you know, creation. But for us, there was a discussion. There was a contemplation. And he says, I want to make them like me. So my image and my likeness. So that means that in order for you and I to understand how we ought to operate, we've got to keep our eyes close to the Lord. We cannot figure this out without him. Why? Because we are made after someone. We're made in the likeness of someone. And we're talking about the likeness of God, he says. So then after giving us his image and his likeness, the next thing that happened, God blessed them, the entire species, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have, have dominion. So right there and then, now this is speaking to the entire species. You and I were in the loins of our original parents, of Adam and Eve, when these words were being spoken. These words were touching the entire script of human, human DNA. The Lord was speaking these words, you know, I'm going to make mankind in my, not Christians, Mankind. That means the entire species. And the reason why this is important is because we are getting outperformed by people that don't know God because they are living up to the original assignment. And sometimes we parked around doing nothing, but hopefully we're going to get to catch up. He says, let us make mankind. The original call is to all mankind. Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. Then he says this. Uh, so God created man in his image and his likeness. And, um, you know, God blessed them and said, be fruitful. And then it says multiply. And all of those, you know, we've had these conversations before, Metro, that when we bring up fruitfulness and multiplication, those are sermons within, in fact, those are books within themselves. There's so much to unpack from, from, um, from being fruitful and from the term multiply, which means to, to grow in scope. But that's not where we're going to camp. Let them have dominion. This is the initial call to leadership. It's the initial call to the exercise of authority. And it was not given to the man, it was given to the species, Adam, male and female created he them, then God blessed them. So that term was, it hit the entire species, the call to dominion. Now the call to dominion, according to human understanding, is the call to dominate. But the call to dominion from, the, from a divine perspective, which we understand as pictured in the life of Christ, is a call to exercise leadership, is a, a call to exercise not our dominion, but heaven's dominion. That's why the New Testament church, what, you know, was is preordination with these words, repent or change your mind, shift the way you think for what? For the domain of the king is here, for the kingdom of heaven is here. So now you and I understand this, is that mankind was given dominion. And anytime you are not exercising dominion, you are abdicating to somebody else who's exercised dominion. I can give you, there are those that have exercised dominion in, 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 in the arts and we go to them for entertainment. There are those that have exercised dominion, uh, maybe even in, in creation. So they created companies and we go and we work for those companies. Every time that something has been built, you know, fabric has been put together to construct an outcome that is beneficial. That is an exercise of dominion. It was the original instruction to the original species. Mankind was not created to be a victim of the elements, to be a victim. That's why in, in most of the places that I preached in Africa, ladies and gentlemen, I preached amongst the poorest of the poor. And my me message has been the same. 
not just sit there and be, you know, and, and condone your poverty. No, there's too much genius on the inside of you to just be a victim of environments. You can do something to change your environment. And I can take you to places where, you know, people that were living in abject poverty became not just farmers, but master farmers that fed the nation in a time of drought. Why? Because of the teaching of the word of God that says, you, if you are find yourself constantly under the circumstances, you are not fulfilling your divine assignment because your divine assignment was a call to dominion. It was a call to exercise some dimension of leadership over the created order. Let them have dominion. The older ones, yeah. How about the younger ones? Them, what is them? The entire species is called to a dimension of dominion. That's why you'll find that God called kids like, 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 like uh, Samuel, because it was irrespective of age. The call to dominion, that's why you find old, old men called by God, Simeon, you know, Moses began his ministry at 80 years old. The Lord is running the gamut as far as the spectrum of age to show you that, no, Christ was discussing with the elders at, at age 12, and they were impressed by his, his acumen. Why? Because this level of dominion has been given to the entire species. Everybody that is listening to this right now, you are called to a dimension of leadership, and the anointing to make that happen is available. But like I said before, what you get out of this weekend is precisely what you want to get out of it. If you want to do church as usual, pick the wrong Friday to come to church. Amen. We want the church to rise up in its true call. Ah, I can give you a quick history as to what happened. The quick history as to what happened is mankind sinned, Genesis chapter 3. And after, the, after sin had come in, um, they appeared to be an upturn. They appeared to be an upheaval in the, in, in the leadership structure. Because before that, it was God. Uh, if you want to go according to, um, you know, the, the rabbinical rendering of, of, of the writings of David, it was God, the angels, for it says it was made a little lower than the angels. True scholars know that, no, it's Elohim. It means it was, mankind was made a little bit lower than God. But I'm going to go with the one what that your Bible says. He was made a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. And he gave him charge over the work of his hands, right? So it was, man, it was God, it was the angelic, then it was man, right? And then it was creation. That was the order. And why did creation exist? The plants, the animals, the soil, the grass, everything. It existed to take on the form that man molded it into. You can have a field right now and it can be run, overrun with weeds. And you can have a field right now and put a man within that field and he can cultivate. And out of that field, you can use, you can feed the nations. Why? It's up to man to have dominion in order for creation to work the way that it's supposed to. In fact, the Lord kind of laid this out there in the book of Genesis chapter two. I wanna show you something here real quick. We're gonna be all churchy today and then tomorrow we're gonna to deal with the practicality of leadership because it's more than just the anointing of leadership. There's also the aptitude and we have to learn to develop that aptitude. But right now what we can look at is when we go to the book of uh, Genesis chapter two, something that the Lord said almost in passing from verse seven, here's what it says. Did I say verse seven? Cool. Let's go to verse four. But now you know there's a verse seven, right? Anyway, here we go. Genesis chapter two and verse four. This is the history of the heavens of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was on the earth, before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. And then it appears that he just throws this out there. There was no man to till the ground. If you notice, really that there is put in, uh, in, in italics, meaning that it's something the scholars put. The original language did not have, there was no man. It says this. So imagine this, the Lord is so good. Hey, by the way, this is the, you know, the history of the heavens and the plants. Way back when, you know, when there was no herb in the field, because God had not caused it to rain and no man to till the ground. What do you mean? Okay, he joined the lack of vegetation. He linked that to the absence of a man that could cultivate the ground. He dealt with the lack of rain being sent. He could have sent the rain, but he didn't. Why? Because there was no man to take the ground, to, you know, to, to tilt the ground. So what you find is this, is that until man is in his place of dominion, there were certain processes that were held back by God on the planet until there was a man in place 
to do something about them. So I don't think that, you know, that has changed. It has pretty much been the story of Israel, the story of the church. It's a man and a woman in the right place who avail themselves to God. And then through them, God exercises his dominion on the planet. So we are still called to that right now. So the, the, the whole case that I want to make is this mankind sinned. And when mankind sinned, we put ourselves under another system. And now when we come to the New Testament, there is what the Bible calls the God of this world, not the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But it says the God of this world and the word that is used in the New Testament for that is speaking about the cosmos. The cosmos is the current arrangement of existence. The way mankind has, the system mankind has created to stratify society, you know, by race, by age, by sex, by, by sex, whatever, however we have done that. That is the world system. So right now, the enemy has, has put in place his system of doing things. And this went for a long period of time. And in that period of time from the book of Genesis, I'll take you through a quick a quick trip here. You know, we, we go from, from Genesis. Um, we, we see, you know, uh, Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden. Shortly after that, you know, the righteous brother is killed by the unrighteous brother, Cain kills Abel, and Cain takes off, uh, you, know, you know, east to the land of Nod. He gets there, the Lord waits, raises up Seth, and in the line of Seth, the Lord begins to establish. So we have, you know, from Lamech, we have Methuselah, we have Noah that comes up from that line. And with Noah, we understand that there's a cataclysm that touches the entire planet because mankind had spiraled into a state of sin that was so bad that the Lord says he is going to kill all of life on the earth, of both man and beast. Why? Because the sin of the one who was given charge to be in dominion. That means that when mankind comes away from the place of exercising dominion according to the heart of God, puts himself under a system that is already judged. Why? Why is it that when you put yourself under a demonic system or, or you always end up in destruction? Because the, the, the realms of the demonic have already been judged. That's why when Christ was going to the men in, 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 in the gatherings, he says, we know who you are, the son of God. Have you come to torment us way before our time? They already know that there's a set date for, their judge, you know, for, for the execution of the judgment pronounced upon them. So that's why whenever you, you, you allow the system that is run by the enemy, to override and, and, and predominate anything you do. I can tell you exactly where it will end up. I, I don't need to you know, have a prophetic insight. I can tell you exactly. You go under that system, the end of it is always death. It's always destruction. Well, anyone, anyway, through the line of Seth, the Lord you know, kept on the, the, the idea of mankind that exercised his dominion over the entire created order. And so we understand that with Noah, Noah and his family were saved and he helped to save, you know, um, you know, several of the species that went on the ark with him. They come out of that line, out of that. And we know that, you know, Japhet went his own way, um, you know, Ham went his own way, Shem went his own way. And through the line of Shem, if several generations after, um, you know, the, the, all the in fact before that, all of them are assembled in one particular place. And they rose up a leader by the name of Nimrod. And Nimrod was declared to be a mighty hunter before the Lord. And uh, he was a Hamite. Well, so, you know, a little bit is told concerning that. There's extra biblical material that you find that makes mention of what really happened there. All we know is that the, you know, everyone was clustered, not doing what they were supposed to be doing. What were they supposed to be doing? Infiltrating the planet and what? And exercising dominion. What did they do? They clustered in one place and refused to move. And then what did the Lord do? The Lord says, there's too much dominion in you to be locked up here. You need to spread out. No, we won't. Confuse the languages. And that's how then the, the rest of the planet was colonized. Hamites went into North Africa. We know that. You know, Japheth went into uh, Goma Magog, into Europe. And Shem remained in that Mesopotamian area, you know, that it, it later became, you know, went up um, uh, east of that and landed in, 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 in present Jerusalem, and etc. So what we know is this, is that, from that spread of humanity in colonizing the planet. It was a step toward fulfilling the divine order of God. The divine order of God was that you're not just gonna predominate a small little space. You need to spread out, why? Because you must be fruitful and the term is multiply. That term multiply means there must be an increase in the measure of your dominion. Now I'm saying this in general because this was God's call on the entirety of our species, on mankind. Even after 
the fallen nature. The Lord almost repeated the same words repeated to Adam. He repeated to Noah in Noah when you get to Genesis around chapter eight. But what we see, and I'm fast tracking this so you understand that. I guess my, 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 my whole idea is this, is if you know the biblical roots for your leadership, you are, and if you understand how deep those roots run, then I'll be honest with you, man. If you refuse to step up, then you're just refusing to obey while you are, you, you know, with a full knowledge of the fact that we are called to, we are called to exercise God's authority on the planet. Hopefully before the weekend is over, we're going to figure out how that's done because it is not done the way the world does it. It's a different system entirely. In fact, it's at such odds with the world's way of exercising authority that in some instances it looks weak, except it gets things done. And when we fast track from there and out of, you know, the earth called these, the Lord go, finds a man, Genesis chapter 12, called Abraham. He says, get out of your father's house and out of your country and go to a land that I'm going to give you and I'll bless you there. What is the Lord saying? I want to increase your footprint, son, but I can't do it here. Go to where I'll tell you. And the what? And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you children like the sand on the seashore. And out from you and your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. I'll give you a great name. So we know that Abraham journeyed until he got into you know, into the land, what we, you know, we, we used to be called the land of Canaan. He got into that territory. And when he got into that territory, you know, he went for years with no son. Um, and then, you know, they tried plan B. Uh, they were able to get Ishmael. After that, the Lord says, that's not the one I want to give my promise to. They waited until Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. And then the Lord came in and blessed them with a promised son, a son called Laughter, Isaac, Isaac. And in Isaac, here is the expansion of dominion. The Lord says to, uh, uh, to Abraham, I'm going to, you know, you shall have kids, you know, like the sin on the seashore. But yet he only had one son of promise. The others were not children of promise. Only one son of promise. And that son of promise, he didn't have 20 or 80. He had two kids, Jacob and Israel. What is the Lord doing? He's allowing the species to grow in what? In scope. They are multiplying. They are growing in, in, in scope. So out of Jacob and Israel, in, from the line of Jacob, we understand that here comes the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, the leadership mantle is still carrying on. Why? Because the Lord has still got the divine plan of a people that are dedicated to him, having and exercising dominion on the planet. So we understand that, the, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Jacob's oldest boy was Reuben. And then he had Simeon and Levi, and then he had Judah. And then his brothers that came after that. You know, uh, Reuben sinned against uh, his father. He went into his father's bed. And it, uh, with his father's concubine. So he was disinherited. Simon and Levi, you know, they, they in, in an outburst of anger, they killed the neighbors called the Shechemites and they got disinherited. The fourth son was Judah. It was through him now that the Lord says, I will establish the leadership line that kings shall come out of the tribe called Praise, which is the tribe of Judah. So then we begin to track down through that tribe. So now notice this, we're coming all the way from Adam. We got to Seth, we got to Noah, we get to Abraham. You know, we got from Abraham, we go to Isaac, we go to Jacob, we go to the 12th. But in that 12th, we zone in on, 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 on Judah. You know, Jacob would have easily put the birthright on, on, on Joseph. In fact, he almost did. That's what the coat of many colors he represented. What does the Lord do? Remove that boy. Send him over to Egypt. Let him prepare for the world to go into hunger. And when it does, he'll feed us. But he's not the line through which. Uh, the, the dominion of Christ would come. So now we, we, we come from the Judah, Perez, etc. We get to you know, Jesse and we come to David. David is then chosen as the first king. Now, before I begin to deal with, 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 with that particular line, which is the call of kings, I'm going to deal with this particular aspect concerning leadership, is that because leadership was God's idea before it was ours, the call to leadership was not our idea. We didn't say, oh, it would be nice if I could have dominion. It was, it was the, holy, the holy conversation that discussed this call. Now notice what it is. Because it came out of the mouth of God, it's more than just an instruction. It is the call of mankind. What was the calling that, that, that came to mankind? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. The reason why I'm saying that is this, is that you can exercise a dimension of leadership in and of your own self. But I absolutely believe that when you, are, when you place yourself under the divine guidance of the Lord, and you line up with man's original call. The potency of the quality of leadership that comes out of that cannot be denied. It is real. 
So that's why you will find, for example, if you don't mind me fast tracking, that the greatest innovation and the greatest acceleration of, of, of human existence in every discipline has happened in the last 2000 years. The multiplied years beyond that, oh, we had figured out the wheel here. We had figured out very you know, antiquated forms of, of technology. But in the last 2000 years, there's been such a tremendous acceleration of, 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 of the expansion of what man can do. And most of that, a lot of it was, was coming in and accelerating in the Europe that had been conquered by the gospel. So the advancement of our species and the exercising of dominion that we have right now, which is sending men to, into outer space, sending men to the moon, et cetera, that has happened in the last 2,000 years. And it has happened in, you know, as from the people of nations that got the gospel early. So something about men's dominion, even today, in what appears to be secular circles, the conquest that has been on the species appears to be coming from, a, in, from individuals. We had received the same word. Their forefathers had received the same word. They turned to the God that you and I serve. Talking about leadership today, but I want to discuss the call of God to leadership. You must understand the spiritual side of this. Because the day you accept it and you submit yourself to that, you'll begin to see that the Lord can do some pretty crazy and amazing things through you. I want to trace from the nation of Israel to see what the Lord might mean by, uh, by leadership. And we're going to go to the book of Exodus, if you don't mind. This was just the introduction. Amen. Exodus chapter 19. Father, please help me share this right. I don't know if it, some of you have ever cut yourself open, and I'm talking about just self-analysis on the inside, to know what lies beneath you. You know, I... A lot of times I have to deal with Christians that are you know, down in the dumps and not feeling great about themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the times I just have to wonder, do you even know what lies beneath? Do you understand who you truly are? More times than not, I found out that you know, it's not that clear to a lot of people. They think that this is Felix who was born in Zimbabwe and you know, um, the child of Jemison and Evelyn and and all this, there's more to me than that. There's more to me than the, my natural bloodline. It's not what lies on the outside that matters. It's what lies on the inside. It's what lies in the world that is intangible, but is more real than the world that is tangible. The world that existed before the tangible world existed. I'm talking about spirit and the power of the spirit. Now notice this. Here's what God says in Exodus chapter 19. He was saying this concerning Israel, but we understand when we read Ephesians and Galatians that because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are engrafted into the same tradition. So that what he's saying concerning Israel, he's saying concerning all of us. It was verified by Peter in, 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 in the New Testament. But here's what it says in Exodus chapter 19. I'll read from, it says this, um, Uh, from verse 2, and they departed from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain of, uh, before, was rather before the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain of God saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you for myself, brought you to myself rather. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure above all the people of all the earth. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These were the words which, these are the words rather, which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So now you guys, we know that Peter mentioned that, is it in 2 Peter 2, 9? Uh, there about when he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, right? Uh, that we might declare the praises of him that brought us out, out of darkness into his marvelous light. What is said here is reads as if it says a kingdom of priests. But if you look at the lettering, it's got malech, then it's got the term for priest. It's literally meaning that you will be, you will be unto me kings and priests. So there's a concept of regal or royalty attached to the priestly. Peter repeats it and says, you are a royal priesthood. The royal part is talking about kingship. Within the domain of kingship, it's talking about leadership. Because that's what kings are. It, kings are those 
who lead nations, empires, etc., etc. So the call to the royal part of you and I, it's not just so we can hang out and say, I'm a king's kid and, and put it on a t-shirt and walk around like a bunch of dummies. No, it's that we are called to exercise dominion because kings have dominion, which is what is then called kingdoms, right? So now the calling that the Lord gave to Israel that was repeated to be amended for the New Testament church by Peter reveals that there's a calling, God help me say this right, there's a calling to kingship and priesthood. So that means if I was to cut you open and look at on the inside with spiritual eyes, I'll see two rivers running in you, the kingly river and the priestly river, not one or the other, both. What is crazy about this call? And in fact, you know what? Let's deal with this from the book of Revelation. Uh, we said what? Uh, First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You know, a, you know, royal means kingly priesthood, a holy nation. The term holy, hagios, means set apart. Right, holy nation, his own special people who uh, are to proclaim the virtues or the goodness or the greatness or the glory of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we read Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, let's go there real quick. Let's track with me, folks. Some of you are like Felix, you're telling us something we already know. Good for you. Write a book, I'll buy it. I'm, I definitely will. I want to sign copy though. Otherwise, let's just chill out and listen. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. And I have to hammer this home. Many, many sermons that you've heard concerning this, but I'm wondering if you're living it. Because again, let me, let me just tell you this, is that um, the ancient or the Hebraic understanding of, of knowing something, to say that you know something, that word that they use does not mean you cognitively, mentally can recall that that's not knowing something our entire school system is what go and learn a bunch of facts and then tell us what you know what what you what you memorize on a test paper no but in in, in israelic and even believe it or not in old greek understanding is that in before they can say you know this it is revealed not by what you claim or what you regurgitate or what you can recall it is revealed by who you have become if your information has not changed you then you have not learned it you read about it but you don't know it the only time you know it is when you have acted it out and it has changed you. So that's why I just want to push back against the thought that oh, I already know this about kings and priests. It says this, and he has made us kings. I mean, I mean verse, uh, chapter, chapter one and verse six of the book of Revelation. And he made us kings and priests to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So it's speaking concerning Christ. And this is the message that John is sending to the seven churches. But as he does that, the, there's this little thing that is thrown in there that the Lord has made us into not a, a key, not a royal priesthood or a regal priesthood. No, he has made us into two distinct lines or two distinct offices, kings and priests. Ah. That's why Jesus is not king. The way you sign the name, you know, the, the, this term for Jesus, for those that do, you know, sign language, is what? King of kings. He's the king of kings. He's not just king. He's king. Well, which kings is he king over? Look in the mirror, folks. And then, it, it, but having said this, we want to come to an understanding as to what that means. Because sometimes people think that it's such an elevated place of privilege that ought to have me have everybody serve me because I'm so special. And now uh, we begin to talk about the wealth of the wicked is laid out for just, and we begin to go with warped senses of what is called the dominion theology. That thing, we're just going to take over things by force. And then, and then, and, and oh, that's not the way dominion is exercised in God's economy. We, we, that's not the way you dominate. Christ came and showed us how dominion is exercised in the New Testament. All my seven mountain people, we're just going to go and take over the arts and take over this. Not if the product you're producing is of less quality. The only way you get to dominate is when you produce something more excellent than the thing that is there right now. So look, let's Revelation chapter five and verse six. Um, sorry, uh, in verse 10. 
I'll read from verse eight for context. Now, when he had taken up the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden balls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's powerful, man. That can preach for weeks. It says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you've redeemed us to God out of every tribe and tongue and people and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign forever. Ah, okay. When we look at this, here's what we understand, is that the calling that is within the church, you and I that are saved, is that out of mankind was given dominion over, over the, the earth, a distinct leadership call was placed on us that are bought by the blood of the lamb. And what he made us at the new birth was just not a sinner saved by grace, brother. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. A sinner is what you used to be, dumb dumb. You're not a sinner anymore. Oh, but I sin, yeah, but you do, but that's not your identity. It's no longer your identity. We know that what if any man is in Christ, what he's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, everything has become new. That's not just a cute, you know, a scripture to give our Sunday school for mem mem scripture memorization. It's the truth. So, so many of us are so acquainted with this carnal earthly version of ourselves that we have no idea, none whatsoever, about the true scope of our spiritual identity. So we look with wonder to men like Abraham, even great heroes of mine like David and, and Moses, and we think that those guys are just so more special. But when you begin to understand what was given to you and I in the new covenant, ladies and gentlemen, that's why it says, how shall we escape if we, you know, if we refuse such a great salvation. The whole idea is this, within you and I, the calling that the Lord has given is that he has called us that are his children to be kings and priests on this planet. Now you and I understand that in the, in the story of the children of Israel, we see that the, 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 the priestly line was established with the, with, with the Levitical line, with the line of Levi. In Leviticus chapter eight, we see the anointing of, 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 of the original priest. So it was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi. And out of the Levites, the Lord chose Levi, the first man, to be the first high priest. Moses was of the same line again. He was from the tribe of the, of, of the priesthood, but it was his brother Aaron upon whom that first inauguration of the priestly, earthly priestly anointing took place. And in fact, if you want to study some of what we call to in our priest, priestly function, read the anointing of Aaron. It's very, very significant, very significant. Blood and oil was put on the tip of his ear, on the tip of his right thumb, on, on his right big toe. And all of that is symbolic of, of, of a lot. It's very, very deep. The garments that he was made to wear were said, they are for glory and for beauty. So there's a part of the, the, the priestly calling that is just glorious. It just radiates God. And it is downright supernatural because we know that rod of Aaron, you know, it budded, meaning what? There was a supernatural life that was given to that which he touched. That's the earthly, ironic line. So we know that the, which you're talking about kings and priests, and we are people that constantly want to trace something to the point of origin. The priestly anointing, we are led to Aaron. The kingly anointing, we are led to Judah, the tribe of Judah. I think it's in Judges chapter one, is it verse eight or 18? When, when they, it was asked the question, who shall go before us to take the land? And, and, and the Lord says, what? Let Judah go first, for unto him have I given the land. Shortly after that, again, the entire nation of Israel goes to war with Benjamin. And the question is asked, Lord, in this battle against our own brother, who shall go first? It says, let Judah go first. So we see that the line of Judah was favored to be the kingly line. That's why Jesus, according to what his earthly pedigree and his earthly genealogy, Bartimaeus asks in, 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 in Luke chapter 18, Jesus, thou son of David, the line of Judah, have mercy on me. And that was the earthly anointing in the earthly ministry. You and I don't trace our kingship or our priesthood to Aaron or Judah. We don't. This is where it gets a little interesting. When you want to understand 
And again, I want to just pull back the soil and show you the roots of what you got into when you came into salvation. It's a little deeper than most of us give us credit. So, so, so I'll begin. Let's go to uh, let's go to Matthew chapter one, just because we can. Pastor Linson, um, just just give me my time. I I'm an hour ahead, so consider in a form of jet lag. I might just go on forever here. I don't intend to take forever. Tomorrow morning we're going to be dealing in, with leadership from from a very practical standpoint. You you're not going to want to miss the morning session, and you most definitely want, don't want to miss tomorrow night. I said what? I said Matthew chapter one. So if you can send me on chat or something and just tell me how much time I have, because I'm just going like a house on fire and I can hardly see anything. I see a few wonderful faces. Hope you guys are staying awake. Matthew chapter one. Lord, help me to say this right. One of the more, the least read portions of scripture, but we're going to read it because we have the time. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon got Boaz, begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And David, the king, begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers by the time that they were carried away to Babylon. After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Sheatel, Sheatel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abihu, Abihu begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azar, Azar begot Zadok, Zadok begot Akim, and Akim begot Eliod, and Eliod begot Eliezer, and Eliezer begot Nathan, and Nathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot, begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Meshach, or who is called Christos, who is called the Christ. What is interesting is if you read this, every male in, that is discussed here had a generation he produced. So somebody begot somebody begot somebody begot somebody. We get to Jesus and it appears to just stop. Uh, so According to our inheritance, I'm trying to wrap, see if we can wrap our mind around our leadership core from its spiritual roots. Our line of inheritance is this. There's something that Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 9. Let's see if I have it already pulled out. If not, I'll just, I'll just go ahead. Isaiah chapter 9, we usually read this at Christmas time. God, please help me say this. From verse 6, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. So you and I already understand that this is a messianic, it's a messianic, um, you know, prophecy, right? Unto us a child was born, the child was born, the son was given, amen. Jesus, the child, Christ, the son. Jesus Christ, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Aha. The government, meaning the governing authority shall be upon his shoulders. Not on his head, but upon his shoulders. That's very, very important. Uh, it says this, and his name shall be called Wonderful. These are the names of who? Christ, the child who was born, the son was given. The one with the government or the order of authority upon his shoulders. It says this, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. Then it says this, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom uh, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. For uh, the time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. It's speaking concerning this mysterious one who was mysterious to Isaiah, but who was revealed in our time. The one revealed to be, to, to, to be Christ. When we look at Matthew's genealogy, it appears that Jesus did not birth anybody. So what in the world do you mean by calling him everlasting father? Did not fathers produce sons? And the answer is, yeah, in the genealogies, both in Luke and in Matthew's genealogies, Everyone in that line 
had a child except Christ. In fact, Isaiah saw this crisis. And uh, Isaiah saw this in Isaiah chapter 53. If we can turn there, just a few more chapters behind it. You're like, dude, we come here to learn about leadership. This is it. If you don't understand the spiritual roots, you know, then, then, you, then, you, then you don't know what, you, what you're entering into. The roots for our call to leadership run deep. They run real deep. Who has believed our report, Isaiah asks. He says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For you shall grow before them as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. We know he's talking about Christ, right? And um, he had no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's talking about Christ as he was on the road to crucifixion. He did not look attractive. Nothing about him would draw us to us. He was repulsive to the sight. In fact, but how did we respond to it? He says, there's no, he has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him, smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. And he tells us, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the punishment of our wholeness, our shalom, was placed upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And then he says this. Um, where are we, Felix? By his stripes we were healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Now, you must understand, Isaiah is seeing this existential crisis of this very special individual who's called to an assignment that is misunderstood by the world. And Isaiah is seeing him suffer. And those that are watching him are thinking that he's suffering because he has offended God. And then Isaiah was revealed to him, no, he wasn't wounded for himself. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised, for our iniquities. Now, I want you to see that this prophet is seeing in the prophetic telescope a horrifying image of the crucified Christ. Let's see what, what, how he responds to this. He says, uh, you know, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. He had to open not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Then he says, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. What do you mean by that? Isaiah saw a crisis. He saw a man die young. And so he asked, because he was cut from the land of the living, who is going to declare his generation? Why? The entire Matthew chapter 1 that we read, the son declared the generation of the father. The father's name and his line and his DNA and his calling was passed on to the son. But Isaiah is looking. Now, you must understand he does not have this. He's seeing in part, looking through a glass dimly. And he's seeing this crucified Savior cut off. The term cut off means what? Cut off is used as if somebody who has been removed or who has been, or, or who has been severed before his time was cut off from the land of the living. It says, who shall declare his generation? Because he could not see. A generation after him. But then he made this he made this, this promise, and there's a reason why I'm share, sharing this, ladies and gentlemen, because this is what is rooted in our identity and what makes us not just leaders just over you know situations, but that there's a calling in a river, an anointing that runs within us. That when we know this and we exercise this in humility, special things will happen. You have to know your bloodline. All the children of Israel did. And you're part of a bloodline you may misunderstand. But we're going to we have some understanding today. So, so, so he was taken from, from prison and from judgment. Who shall decay his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made a grave with the, uh, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to, cry, to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul in a, an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Wait, but I thought he was cut off from the from the land of the living. I, I, I was wondering who was gonna declare his generation. It says what? You shall see his seed. He shall, he shall see his seed. That term seed is, means his offspring. Means his genealog genealogical line. His progeny. His descendants. He shall see his seed. 
He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall hear, sorry, sorry rather, he shall bear the iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil of the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now we see a man cut off and then the promise is that he shall see his seed. <laughs> Few more minutes, Pastor, Pastor Linson. He says, you shall see, see, the whole reason why I wanted to share this is so that you and I understand. I'm going to go straight to the writings. Psalm chapter 22. Here's what Psalm chapter 22 says. All the way down to verse 30. Now, all of you that understand Psalm chapter 32 is it's, it's the psalm where David is speaking almost as in the person of, of Christ. You know, um, uh, for the dogs have surrounded me. They gave me, I'll read a few verses. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gave at me with their mouths and like raging. I poured out like water and my bones are out of joint and my heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a portrait and my tongue clings to the mouth. You have brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me and the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet and I count all my bones. They look and stare at me and they divide my garments. You and I understand that this is talking about Christ. But I love what is said in um in in. In, in verse 30, right toward the, ter you know, the termination of the psalm, it says, a posterity shall serve him. And, uh, you know, the old King James says this, and the seed shall serve him. And it shall be recounted to the Lord for, it, for the, to the next generation. It's a little bit of a confusion with, with the scholars there. There's been many renderings of this particular uh, scripture. Let me just share exactly, let me get my point. My time is almost up. He says, the seed shall serve who shall serve Christ and shall be then counted to him by the Lord. As, as a generation. So the one who died without children, why is he called everlasting father? Because a seed shall serve him. And what that, shall, that seed shall be counted as his generation. That means that we are of the generation of Christ before the father. That means that our natural bloodline is not traced through the, just the human line. It's traced through Adam, you know, Abraham as it comes to Christ. And then from Christ, we are the generation of, you know, that then serve him. And as we serve him, that's why his blood was spilled for us, giving us a blood connection to him. This is the new, you know, the new covenant in my blood, bringing us into his bloodline. Oh God, please help me say this. Why is this necessary that we understand this? It's necessary that we understand so that you know your spiritual genealogy. What is your, you know, there was an expectation of leadership in Joseph because he knew that Judah was a line of kings. But if you don't understand that you have the genealogy that is not traced by the human line, but that is traced by the supernatural line of Christ, then here's what you will know. Hebrews chapter 7 says concerning Christ, thou art a priest forever, according to the order, not of Aaron. Thou art a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, now what does that mean and what does that going to do with leadership? Melchizedek was the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High. Genesis chapter 14, when, when, when Abraham was, um, went to war against the, the five kings of Sodom. So what you understand is this, ladies and gentlemen, I guess my whole point is this, the two distinct rivers that run through you and I, let me calm down and just say this, the two distinct rivers that run through you and I is the river of the priesthood and the river of kings. Two distinct anointings that are found in the children of God because our spiritual genealogy traces to Christ we are the seed that serve him and are then seen in heaven, are counted in heaven as his generation. And that's why when he was raised, he raised us up together with him. So what does that mean? When you begin to understand the, the vitality of these two offices, the priesthood had to do with entering into God's presence to commune with God. The kingship had to do with exercising the ideals of God and exercising that dominion on the earth. Kingship was not a heavenly call. It was an earthly assignment. Priest, the priesthood was toward heaven. 
the kingship is toward earth. What are you talking about, Felix? Make sense before, before, um, before we go to bed. What's important is this. You and I are, are called to two distinct areas of effectiveness. There's a heavenly call where our prayer is highly consequential. Our worship penetrates the realms of God in a powerful way. We read in the book of uh, um, Revelation earlier how, you know, there were golden bowls before the throne of God, which are the prayers of the saints. There's spiritual activity that we engage in, that of the priestly variety. The priestly is what? Is offering praises unto him. The high praises of him who has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. As priests, we are called to be worshipers, to be intercessors, to be prayer warriors. That is a calling that is directed toward heaven. But the Lord does not want a bunch of people that are just so amazingly heavenly and earthly incompetent. So he released another anointing of dominion, which is the anointing that is in the kingly anointing. You don't go to heaven as a king because there's a king that is there already. Our kingship is our exercise on the planet. When he says, and we shall reign forever, what is he talking about? We shall reign with him. Millennialists will tell you that. We shall reign with him here on earth. So again, the calling of kingship is got to do with the exercise of heaven's dominion on the earth through a vessel that opens him and herself up to God operating in us. Uh, so I come from a place in Africa where nobody can outpray us. You Malayalis think you can pray? No, my friend. I've been to your prayer meetings. You know, Katawa, Katawa, Katawa for a long time. Good, go for it, man. You, I've never really heard groaning that you will hear in an African prayer meeting. I, I learned to pray by watching an Alpha channel, an old man kneel on the side there and groan before the Lord with such, such a depth of supplication. I, 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 my mind was boggled as a 12 year old and learned how to pray. But here's what the enemy has then done. He has made some of these places be amazing priests and lousy kings. Amazing priests and lousy kings. And he just says, oh, no, you know, just, uh, hey, God loves you, man. And yes, you've got dominion in the heavenlies, et cetera, et cetera. Satan in the name of all, all of that, the part, part of the priesthood, the supernatural realm, et cetera, et cetera. The kingship has got to do with the establishment of God's dominion and God's order on the planet. It's got to do with earth. Isaiah 66, heaven is my throne. So what does the Lord do in heaven? He sits. The earth is my footstool. What does he do on earth? He stands. So what does that mean? It means that when he gives us through our priests with dominion in the heavens, we are raised together with our great high priest, seated together with him in heavenly places. We sit in the heavens, but we've got to stand on the earth. What does that mean? Is that, ladies and gentlemen, if we are causing absolutely no ripple, we have no effect on our neighborhood, on our school, on our place of work, even in the place where our church is, then maybe we don't understand our bloodline. I'm a student of, of, of New, New Testament history. And, um, and if this is something I did after Bible college, you know, I just out of a, a, a pursuit, and I am intrigued to this day. I am absolutely blown away by how this ragtag group of believers conquered the known world without a weapon. Without their Second Amendment rights, they conquered the north. They conquered mighty armies, armies that had no code of ethics, where where being nice was required, like we have nowadays. No, no, no. There were armies of nations. That, look at Rome. Rome was such a genius at torture. They created a crucifix and the cat of nine tails, and yet this ragtag army of individuals that have you know that have taken hold of the heavens by their priestly anointing began to take a hold of the earth by exercising the, God's dominion, God's way. How inconceivable is it? And even uh, what leadership book can we read to find out how Jesus who was crucified by the Roman Empire as an ins insurrectionist in what they call the armpit of the empire, which was Palestine. How could that common ins insurrectionist and criminal be now worshipped by the entire Roman Empire 250 years, 300 years after, after his ascension. 
300 years after, in less than 300 years after they killed him. And he was so inconsequential to them, ladies and gentlemen, they didn't even hardly wrote his name down. Josephus wrote something and, you know, Tertullus, you know, Tertullian may have written something, but there was no, he was so inconsequential to them. How in the world could it be that, that no name someone that in 315, Constantine declared that the entire realm of the Roman Empire was to bow down their knee to but one, that crucified savior. Here's what I'll tell you right now. If there's a leadership book we need to read, it's the leadership book that he left behind. It's the leadership style that he left behind because it is the style of leadership that conquered the world. And you know what? When we talk about like father, like son, one of the reasons why the Lord says, Jacob, I've loved Esau, I've hated. You know, my Calvinist friends want to make a whole, well, Jacob, I've loved Esau. No, no, here's the thing. Esau sold his birthright. What is the birthright? It was the right to call God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. He didn't care about that. J Jacob care, cared about that. That God would be known in the genealogical line, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So my, my whole encouragement to you and I is this. Our calling to leadership is not some cute thing that we cover over a weekend. It is the basis of our salvation. It's what we were called to the day we got saved. It's what we got born again into. Not just to be amazing priests that just worship and worship and worship. Enjoy yourselves. I enjoy it too. I absolutely love it. I sing some of those songs when I'm by myself. But after that, I've got a question to ask. What measure of dominion are you walking in? What did we learn from COVID? That the things that we sometimes lean on are just, just don't have the ability to hold us up. Some may put their faith in the political system, pray, prophesy, whatever, and now are inventing new prophecies, trying to cover up. The long and the short of it is this. All these man-made institutions that sometimes we lean on, they don't have the genius, ladies and gentlemen, to do what we can do when we step into, the right, into our right calling. Because on the inside of us flows two rivers, flows two major anointings. The priestly anointing is our ability to please God by our worship and our prayer. But then there's also a kingly anointing. It is an anointing that has got to do with what we handle with our hands, what we stand on with our feet. When, we saw, when the Lord says, have dominion over the fish of the sea, he says, um, you know, uh, exercise dominion and subdue the earth. That term subdue means stand on or stamp on. In other words, he was inviting us to leave our footprint over creation. So what we're discussing right now is this, is that the calling to leadership is the calling to affect here on this planet. And the question I have for all of us is this, how much of a ripple, how much of an effect do you have or does the Lord have through you on the planet? The devil is quite happy with us filling our churches and, 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 and staying behind our church doors and, and just stay there. The devil is nervous about us getting out and actually infiltrating and infecting our community. So he says, be heavenly amazing and be earthly incompetent. And there has to come a time when the church, we've got to look ourselves and say, we have too strong a bloodline in the kingship side of the equation to just sit around and be, you know, like a lamp on a log. So again, here's the thing. David, when he was called to be a king, he established the nation of Israel, expanded his borders, negotiated with the kings around it. And out of that, he paid for the building of the temple that his son built. That is something, a landmark he left on the earth. The Psalms that he read were his heavenly, in his priestly anointing, his heavenly, you know, imploring the Lord. Do you know that David was aware of the Melchizedek in line? More, you know, the reason why David, when he went to Abiathar and he says, I'm hungry. Abiathar says, we don't have any food except what is found in the holy place. He says, oh, give it to me. It's okay. Why did David say that? Because he already had an, an understanding that there is, a, there is a line of the priests that does not come from Levi. The only line from the priest that is not from Levi is the Melchizedekian line. What is it? It's not just a one strand anointing of, of the priest. It's a priest who is also a king. Who wears the priestly turban and also the crown of the king. Who wears, you know, uh, the, the, the breastplate with the 12 stones, but also wears the armor to go to war because that's what kings do. So here's what I, I'm saying in closing. Sorry I went over my time.
We are called to a measure of dominion. And I'm wondering, how comfortable are we in allowing the Lord to cultivate that dominion in and through us? A lot of people are complaining right now in the church about censorship. Well, you know, you know, Zuckerberg is censoring us and all this. And you know, there's a there's a cute little book called Who Found My Cheese. I don't know if you guys ever read Pastor Linson, please let me take five more minutes, guys. It's it's a Friday, and I'm, it's actually later for me than it is for you. Um, please let me say let me say this. There's a little book that was written, it was a runaway classic called Who Moved My Cheese. In fact, most um they say most uh Fortune 500 CEOs that was required reading for them. Short little um little fable, you know, about these little um mice and two two little like miniature type of people that were walking around the maze one day and they found cheese and then they began to enjoy that cheese. And one day they came and the cheese was not there. So now one of them at least had the foresight to go look for new cheese. The other one sat there and complained and wondering who moved my cheese. Now here's the, here's the little story that I'm seeing right now. What I'm seeing is this, is that Christians were walking around and we found cheese. It's called Facebook. It's called Twitter. It's called all these things. We didn't create it. We just found it. We began to subsist of it, posting our stuff, putting our live services on there. And we acted like it was ours. Because we found it, we have this sense of ownership. And we forget that, no, he didn't even pay a dime to be on Facebook. So what am I saying? I'm saying now the church is, is crying censorship. Well, I can't believe, you know, in my First Amendment rights. Yeah, here's the thing. Mike, Mark Zuckerberg has every right to say what can be done on his platform. With all the billions of dollars that we have in the church, billions of dollars that are in some, you know, that are in, in jets and in amazing structures and amazing buildings, None of us have thought of establishing a platform by which the gospel can be preached without worrying about censorship. All we're doing is complaining. We enter into the kingdom that Zuckerberg built, that Jewish boy built. And then now we begin to complain when he begins to censor us. All the services we had all these years, all the mega churches, 40, 50,000, you know, people, in, you know, in all of, I can name them by name. I'm not, you know, I'm not being mean, I'm just, Talking honestly, we literally as Christians in this nation, never mind the globe, in this nation, we spend billions of dollars a year. But here's what we maybe we've not been taught. That you're not just priests that are complaining that you cannot meet in the building. Well, they're censoring us and all this. I know Christians are that of COVID, man. I, I, very strong Christians, probably stronger than most of us that are here right now, men of God that died because of COVID. And we complain about that. No, you don't want me to do this and you don't want me to do that. They're keeping us out, away from the church and away from the building, et cetera, et cetera. So the question I have is simply this. We're on Zoom right now. Who created this platform? You know, I've been speaking along these lines and one of the guys that, I, that, that, that is a good friend of mine has been working on, on just a podcast platform. Um, and it's about, it was mentioned by, by Forbes fairly recently. He's my good buddy. He comes to my Monday night Bible study. And because I, I just found this amazing group of geniuses within our faith, that for some weird reason, they think that after they've lifted their hands and prayed, that that is the end of their dominion. And I'm like, no, man, living on the inside of us is the genius of geniuses. How is it that we have not figured some of this stuff out because we don't teach our children? There's so many smart kids that are here right now. Some of you kids that are here, you youngsters, are smarter than anything I was ever at your age. And here's what I'm calling you to. It's, you're not just called to be a priest that loves the Lord and sings hill song songs. You're supposed to be king. A king on the earth means you exercise dominion. Meaning what? You're not just on the consumer side of worship music and other people's teaching and other. No, you are on the supply side of that. I know you're an amazing priest. I'm just wonder what I'm just wondering what type of a king you are. How do you? administer the domain that has been entrusted to you. The people that have been entrusted to you. How do you exercise dominion over your, your greater gifts, your greater abilities? What's your level of stewardship over the gift of God that is in you? That is not the function of priests. That is the calling of kings. David, all he had was a sling. Look at what he did with it. That's a king exercising dominion over the things he owned. All he had in his life at that time was the clothes on his back and the sling. He went and he found some stones. And that little bit that he had, he exercised dominion enough to win a victory for Israel. How are you stewarding your gifts, O king? 
That's why Pastor Linson, the last time we talked, I said, my brother, you got way too much. There's a lot of ability in you that, that we saw at, at, at university. Every kid I ever talked about, just talked about, I pray that at Metro you bring that to bear. And I'm going to say this and it may be controversial. Don't let anybody shrink your ability, my brother. You utilize the gifts. I'm talking about the practical one. I know you're prayerful. Very, very prayerful. But I know you're a great organizer as well. You have an engineer's mind. Use it. To what? To exercise dominion. I got Reggie here. Absolutely amazing. All you other guys that I've known. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please. Wonderful priests. But now I'm calling us to dominion, man. Is there something that, why can God not invent through us? Why can God not, you know, um, introduce a, a, a service to the world that the church has come up with? Instead of sitting on a, like a lump on a log and then complaining about services that other people offer. Come on, kings. Tomorrow, what we're going to learn about is this. We're going to learn about how to cultivate the mind, the posture, the very spirit of a leader, because none of those things come to us, just you're not born with it. What, what did David have to do to, be a, to, to become the king that he was? The Lord sent him to kingship school, where? In the wilderness, away from supporting structures, living in caves, sleeping where the sheep were sleeping. As a, as a, what was the Lord doing? He was teaching, why? Because the best of the kings, are not, they don't just fall from the sky and are awesome. Why do you think Christ was silent for 30 years? All we knew is this. What was said about him in the book of Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and chapter 2, verse 52, is that the child grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That means that for those 30 years, he was in a growth spurt. So that why? So that three years of dominion will be sufficient to change the world forever. Why didn't he become, he was born king of the Jews, right? That's what the wise men said. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why did he only come into the ascension of his calling at 30 years old? Because that entire calling, you may come with it, but the gifting and the ability to execute on it is learned on the learning curve. The son who learned obedience by the things he suffered. That's what the Hebrew says concerning Christ. He had a learning curve. Jesus, God in the flesh, learned. So what does this say in closing? Bible's closed. Computer is closed. What does that mean? It means that we have to learn how to become the stewards and the people that exercise dominion. We're going to find out that a service orientation and a, a, you know, a service orientation is one of the keys, man. It's one of the keys. It's one of the keys. It's the key to just about any major discovery. And Christ taught his disciples to have that impulse, to have that proclivity. Because the kings of our kingdom, they operate in a different set of principles. And when you know the heart, the mind, the king, the eyes, the ears, you know, of, of the king, you're going to find out that my hope is this. You activate those already inherent abilities. That the only way that they can be activated is by use. That's our introduction to our leadership weekend. Flowing on the inside of you. Pastor Linson, get ready to take over, my brother. Flowing on the inside of you. It's two major callings, two major rivers, two major anointings. The priestly is what we engage in when we're in church. Why did the Lord shut out the doors to our church for all these months? I think because he had a bunch of priests and not enough kings. And it's like, okay, now you guys are out there, do something. Figure out. Figure it out. If we're so used to going behind closed doors and lifting up holy hands, that's the easy part. What if we had to figure out right now? I'm going to figure out technology. I'm sitting here with, you should see with the, with the way my desks look like. Like Felix, the, the one who's not a techie, I have to figure it out. Why? Because we have to exercise dominion. And exercise dominion, we get greater dimensions of dominion the more we engage in the learning curve. You don't just wake up and you can run an entire nation. Like Peter, uh, Jordan Peterson says, just make your bed. Let's begin, begin where, you are, where, where you are. Amen. Uh, Reggie, I think it's you. So you can take over now, my brother.